welcome everyone to the first edition of this SDG Act Co Action Conclave 2020. Uh, we are uh, conducting today's session focusing on SDG Goal 16. The goal states to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Youth Forum is a project under Alexis Society. Our team consists of inspired individuals, young students and professors who are solely interested in creating positive so uh, social impact by conducting research on policy issues, writing thought-provoking and insightful blogs, designing creative social campaigns, organizing life-changing and, in and interviewing leaders and change makers. It is correctly said the youth are not only leaders of uh, tomorrow, but also partners of today. We at Youth Forum, a team of creative and uh, encouraging uh, individuals, rest our faith on the above stated thought and work with a sole mission, a mission to change the world for better. Through this first edition of SDG Action Conclave, we wish to bring together the change makers and the leaders from around the globe under hashtag act for SDGs campaign week for the United Nations. It will help to prepare an actionable agenda that will aid all its achieve all in achieving the sustainable development goals through all the initiatives and more. While the world leaders meet virtually at the United Nations General Assembly to take up their issues and give a solution to the tough times, we are trying to do our small bit by taking action and raising awareness and initiating a direct direction ahead. The turning point of the planet and the people need to now. At this point, I would like to introduce to all our special guest for today, who is also a SDG 16 advocate. Deidre Debruka is from Israel. She is an advocacy coordinator for For Us, a global civil society network which, which supports the efforts of 69 national development platforms and seven regional coalitions to fully uh, imply the to fully see the implications of the 2030 agenda in the countries and regions. Deidre is also an active member of the steering a uh, group of SDG Watch Europe, a European cross-section uh, civil society alliance, which aims to support and monitor the implementation of Act Agenda 2030 by the EU and its member states. Deidre is the co-author of a paper on Goal 16 of the SDGs, which was launched by the organization for us. In the report, it includes 18 national case studies on civil spaces produced by the members of Forus in different countries across the world. Moving forward, I would like to introduce the chair for today. His name is Kunal Mandal. Kunal Mandal is the co-founder of Gyan Space, a gamification company which works on quizzes and other games as a tool for personal growth and people's encouragement. He is also a co-founder He's also a co-founder of the uh, organization, a travel organization, which is named City, uh, which is named uh, City uh, CityBytesIndia.com. It is a travel portal which uh, which helps travelers discover and book inspiring city experiences by local experts. Currently, he is on a mission to teach curiosity as a life-changing uh, goal to the youth. He believes in empowering youth and to make them uh, achieve more than they thought of achieving. I would here like to hand over to uh, Mr. Mandal for further uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Radhika, and everyone who is joining and listening in, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you to the SDG Action Conclave 2020. It's a pleasure for us to curate this experience for all of you and inspire you to eventually take action for a sustainable world. 
So I have a very, very special guest today uh, to, for today's session. And we have Deirdre De Burka from Ireland. And welcome, Deirdre. Thank you so much for uh, finding time out for us. And uh, you're here. We're glad to have you with us. Thank so, you. Let me uh, dive into, since the discussion is about uh, goal uh, 16, and it's to about inclusive societies and uh, providing justice for all. Uh, but let me let me dive into the biggest crisis of all, probably. Right? Whether it's the economic crisis in Venezuela, or whether it's the civil war in Syria, or political crisis in Afghanistan and South Sudan, or ethnic conflict in Myanmar, the world has never seen such a huge refugee crisis. According to the UNHCR Global Trends Report, 79.5 million people were forcibly displaced in 2019. And 40% of them were children below 18 years of age. Now, legally, they're minors, so their rights come probably last on the least. And they are the most ignored, yet probably the most important piece of the puzzle, in my opinion. Uh, Deidre, you have been at the forefront raising voice on this issue. Uh, please tell us what are the challenges that exist when it comes to abundant refugee children and how we chalk out a better future uh, for these kids. Yeah, very good question. And um, it's very important when we're talking about Goal 16 today that we mention this uh, because Goal 16's vision is for an inclusive society. And more than half the refugee population in the world are made up of children. As you say, they're under 18. They're extremely vulnerable. They very often have had to leave their homes or away from their families. Many of them are unaccompanied. They are vulnerable to abuse, to exploitation, to uh, recruitment into um, military forces. Um, they are also vulnerable to trafficking. So there's many different threats that children, who, refugee children face. And it is absolutely incumbent on the international community to prioritize the needs of these children. So in any humanitarian action that we really focus on the children, the refugee children, and obviously their needs are broad. They have a need for education. They have a need, well, first of all, for protection, very importantly, child protection. They have a need for education. They have a need for health care. They have a need for, you know, uh, a home. Um, somewhere is a shelter, um, they have a need for security and so on. So a lot of the focus of SDG 16 is very relevant for refugee children. But as you say, because they're a mobile population, because they fall between different, often they're not in their own um, country of origin, they're somewhere else, they fall between the cracks and they're not, their needs are not the responsibility of anybody in particular. So we need to prioritize those needs. We need to prioritize refugee children and to make sure that their needs are met. One way we can do that, and this is just one possible uh, solution, is to increase the connectivity of refugee children. So by that, I mean, um, it's increasingly recognized that even though refugee children desperately need food, shelter, clothing, education, and so on, they also have a need to be connected particularly to their families of origin. So very often providing them with the means to connect to the internet so that they can talk to loved ones, so that if there's any attempt at family reunification or family tracing, it can be done. But also, you know, the, the internet is a source of information, a source of education. It can also be a way of transferring money to those children and to keeping them safe. So I would say a lot of projects, a lot of initiatives nowadays are about trying to make sure that refugee children are connected and do have the digital means to actually um, meet some of these needs that I've talked about. So I do think there is a lot that can be done for refugee children and Goal 16 is part of the uh, process of helping them. Great, thank you so much for helping us understand uh, that piece of the puzzle. Now, moving from there, a lot of people have started this conversation that refugees are the problem. But if I uh, look at the recent reports that I've read, it says that, uh, you know, refugees have been volunteering as frontline health workers in Colombia and UK, uh, making, uh, you know, soap and other forms of uh, small industries in Lebanon and Niger. They are uh, sewing masks and protective gear in Iran, 
helping construct isolation centers in Bangladesh where the Rohingyas are being, uh, you know, currently uh, don't know what to do. And uh, elsewhere around the world, they're contributing time and help in different forms uh, to the needy in their communities. Now, what, what do you have to say about that and how we can make an inclusive society where they are included and we realize that the potential lies in the human being, not necessarily the crisis is a negative thing. I think that's really important. And very often when we apply a label to somebody, for example, we say he or she is a refugee child or whatever. We only see the refugee and the, the crisis situation they're in, but not the individual themselves, as you say. And it's the human being that's important. Very often these children are very resilient despite their vulnerability. They're resilient. They bring with them their skills, their knowledge, their previous, you know, uh, life history and so on. And many of them have a really important contribution to make. And it's amazing how when you visit some of these refugee camps, the informal economies that have developed in those camps and the kind of small businesses and enterprises that can be created. And again, children and young people making a very important contribution to them. So again, I think it's incumbent on the international community to fund these refugees, to provide the kind of supports and financial um, incentives in those refugee camps to actually allow people to create livelihoods for themselves. There's a lot of skills, there's a lot of potential there, but they do need support and, um, and help in doing that. So I think, again, the point you make is, is a very important one and one that the international community and humanitarian organizations need to pay attention to. Uh, can you share uh, one or a few examples of what you have done at the organizations that you've worked for before for, uh, you know, either uh, for the children uh, and their rights or, uh, you know, how do you make these refugees uh, become a part of the mainstream? Well, you know, I, I in, the, in my past, I have worked with World Vision. It's an international child focused or child rights organization. And World Focus do, or World Vision does a lot of really important work with children in refugee camps around the world important place to start is education. So they often make sure to create child-friendly spaces within the refugee camps because the refugee camps can be very unsafe places for children. And in those um, you know, safe places, they provide education and support for children. And they begin to identify maybe what it is, the ways in which they can help children, what kind of training. I mean, if you have you know, young adults, for example, uh, children in their teens as they approach 18, their needs are going to be quite different from younger children. But either way, you know, education, training, but constantly looking to the future of the child and also to helping to develop their skills and abilities. So World Vision provides a lot of that kind of educational support um, for children who are of school going age and then also training vocational skills training for young people who haven't yet reached adulthood, but who do need to develop vocational skills in order to be able to to create and maintain um, or sustain a livelihood for themselves. No, that's great to hear. So whoever is listening, please check out World Vision and their work related to child advocacy and see some of the things that those organizations are doing. And there you will find inspiration of how you can do things in your community where these people need the help right now. And, and, and it's very important. So check them out. Uh, moving on to the next part of the discussion, which uh, let's say justice, which is an important part of the Goal 16 as well. Uh, one thing that I can't ignore but bring to the discussion is the term called climate justice, right? And uh, uh, it, it's much more than a movement and climate change uh, can have differing social, economic and public health and other adverse impacts on underprivileged populations and that we have understood now. And you have been a member of the Irish Green Party and served as a senator for three years and you have been advocating something called a Green New Deal since uh, 2019, if I'm not wrong. Could you tell us a little bit about it? And where do you see the future of the Green New Deal in the context of the backdrop of the economic setbacks uh, that we see across Europe? Yes, that's an interesting question. So um, the Green New Deal, to my mind, is and, and um, certainly the European Union has been pushing this quite strongly over the last year or two, because I think there's a realization that if we are to move in the direction of more sustainable development and more climate friendly development, there has to be significant investment by the international community. 
So the Green New Deal that the European Union is talking about is one that will be, you know, um, promoted by the EU itself. It's not a global Green New Deal, whereas I believe, and and uh, many of the organisations that I have worked with in international development believe that what there's what there's a need for is a global Green New Deal, and that would mean that the international community would generate the kind of funding and you know that's necessary for a significant programme of investment in different parts of the world to help different regions become more uh, climate resilient and be more prepared for the kind of future that we're going to face in a world that's rapidly changing because of the you know climate crisis that we're entering into so the uh, green new deal would be something that would um i suppose in a way help to redress a lot of the economic imbalances that have developed between different parts of the world there's a lot of criticism these days of international aid that it's just like a sticking plaster and that actually the unjust trading systems that exist between different parts of the world are perpetuating the imbalances, the inequalities between certain parts of the world and others. So to my mind, the purpose of a Green New Deal would, or a global Green New Deal would be to try to address some of these inequalities, historical inequalities, and um, to try and make sure that every region of the world, every country of the world has significant or sufficient investment to be able to withstand some of the climate impacts that they're going to face over the coming years, but also to put in place programs of social protection for their populations, to provide for education, to provide for healthcare, according to the vision of the SDGs. So there's very little point in the international community agreeing an ambitious program of 17 universal goals that apply to every country in the world, unless the investment and the funding to actually make those goals and those that, that vision a reality are also provided. So, you know, we would argue very strongly that a global Green New Deal is a necessity and should be something that is funded uh, in the not too distant future, particularly, I think, in light of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. There's every reason why the international community should come together now and in, as part of building back better uh, after the COVID pandemic, and we're not even through the COVID pandemic yet, but many economies across the world have been very badly um, affected by the pandemic. There is a need for this global Green New Deal. So it really can't happen soon enough as far as, as um, those of us who work in international development are concerned. So do you think uh, Europe would still be able to implement it given the you know, sort of uh, budgetary constraint and the economic uh, problems that are arising there? Yes, I do. I mean, I think what we're living through is an age of monetary and financial innovation, shall we call it. So I think what we're seeing is unusual and unconventional means of uh, producing finance. And so, for example, in Europe in particular, we lived through a financial crisis that started in 2008. And, you know, central banks across Europe took on, and particularly the European Central Bank, took on a very unusual role in bailing out, you know, financial institutions and helping them to stay afloat. That the money that was created to do that was created because the uh, central banks were the lenders of last resort and so on. And I don't understand, and I believe that it is the case, that central banks and, and you know, international financial institutions could take these bold steps also in a time of crisis like this, particularly uh, following the pandemic, to issue that kind of funding that can be distributed then in an equitable way to different countries around the world so that this program of investment and this, this necessary financial support to, um, to enable the SDGs to be realized, particularly by the goal of 2030, which is only a decade away, that that could that that should happen. So I I, I believe, as I say, that the, the the if the will is there, if the political will is there, it can be done. Right. Let's hope that we find the political will sooner than later, and uh, you know that eventually happens. So now, uh, so the second part of the justice question that I would like to ask you is. Uh, uh, you know, post since you mentioned pandemic, and of course we are going through such a difficult time. Uh, so non-availability of e-connectivity has disrupted the legal ecosystem uh, across the world, and access to justice is now harder than ever before. Uh, in India, for example, we have more than 30 million pending cases in in the high courts, 
And uh, so my question to you would be that, uh, what can we do to make justice more accessible for all in this uh, pandemic age or post pandemic world? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that need to be done. My own feeling is that, uh, the, uh, you know, the, one of the most important things to ensure justice for all is the mobilization of ordinary people to better monitor their justice systems. So there is a real need, and that's one of the things that such a strength of the SDGs, it is a, a, a policy framework that encourages <clears throat> the involvement of many different stakeholders in uh, keeping an eye on, in monitoring, in, in making sure that certain uh, commitments are uh, lived up to, that um, certain targets are reached and so on. And so th there's regular monitoring of these goals, the policy goals and the accompanying targets. And that's true of goal 16 as well, which makes a very explicit promise to provide justice for all. So unless our, our justice system, unless our institutions of governance, unless our governments are monitored carefully, their actions and that, that they actually live up to the commitments that they have made, it won't happen. So, you know, the mobilization of different stakeholders to, to monitor the delivery of justice, I would say, is very important. Secondly, you need proper uh, financing of the judicial systems. You need proper training for judges and local officials and, and national officials and so on. And you also need all the other supervisory bodies, um, you know, the different agencies that are put in place to monitor. There needs to be a whole ecosystem of accountability that's put in place. And again, they need to be properly funded so that they can monitor and make sure that, you know, commitments that are agreed to are lived up to and, and delivered on. So I would say there's a lot that needs to be done in the area of justice, but I think again, um, the, the the sort of framework is there in goal 16 and what we need now is to enable people to actually realize that vision and it won't happen tomorrow it, there's a lot of work to be done as you say there's a lot of rolling back and a lot of of um you know lack of justice uh, evidence of lack of justice um to be seen around the world but i think you know we have that infrastructure there or we have that framework there and i think with proper uh, funding of the relevant institutions and the supervisory bodies and the various bodies that provide oversight of justice for all but also enabling ordinary citizens to understand their rights and I think the whole human rights, um, you know, our human rights legislation, international human rights law and national human rights law is also very important here. And we have institutions that are specifically named in Goal 16, national human rights institutions. The aim of Goal 16 is that every country sets up, establishes and funds properly a national human rights institution. And the human rights institutions have a very special mandate and they can call the government to account if human rights are being violated in any fundamental way. So these are the things I think that we need to, to ensure are properly resourced and funded um, so that we can actually realize the vision of Goal 16. So I think uh, one of the key point that you made is the funding part of it. Right? So what I would try and understand from you is that you have worked in this for so long. What are the typical sources of funding that you have seen? And uh, maybe if you could give us, uh, tell us a little bit about like the financial innovations that you've seen happening that can probably be implemented at a scale that can solve the problem a little bit. Well, um, I suppose, first of all, just to say that um, Typically development, I've worked in international development for a long time now, and typically development and more increasingly we're talking about sustainable development and not just traditional development, but it has been funded through um, what they call international development funding. And that's typically funding that's made available from donor countries to the beneficiary countries and also the um, international institutions like the World Bank and the um, IMF and you know the other international development banks or international financial institutions all play a role but things are changing rapidly and you know there is a real need um i believe for the um institutions what they call the Bretton wood institutions of the un and they are the world uh, trade organization the world bank and the world uh, the imf to actually um receive a new mandate 
you know, I think the way uh, international development has been funded and the role that they have played is increasingly outdated. And what we need now is a new look at how do we, um, you know, restore sort of economic activity and economic development to different regions of the world and many countries around the world who have been devastated, not just by uh, the pandemic, but by climate change and other factors. And I think how we do that is to come together as an international community. And I think we almost need a Bretton Woods too. We need a second gathering of international leaders to sort of, you know, name the, the various crises we're facing and to develop an appropriate response, global response to those, you know, cumulative crises now in a timely way before we are overwhelmed by some of those crises. And we know ourselves that the clock is ticking in terms of the climate uh, crisis that we're facing and that if we don't act soon and allow countries to develop their own capacities and their own potential to to uh, you know to, to cope with many of the more uh, damaging impacts of climate change we'll really be looking at quite a devastated world in another few decades so this is what we need and i you know that may sound very uh, dramatic when i say that we need uh, bretton woods too but when you think about it the, Bretton, the first Bretton Woods happened after the Second World War because of the devastation of the Second World War, particularly the economic devastation. And surely it can be argued, and I believe it can be, that we are in a similar situation now. You know, we're in a situation where the global community is very aware the pandemic, this, this COVID pandemic, is the first truly global pandemic that has really impacted on the lives of people in all parts of the world. And it has brought many economies to their knees. And it, the longer it continues, the more human suffering there will be and the more uh, economic difficulties. So there is a need and there is a very justification for the international and the leaders of our, uh, the international community to come together and, in effect, to look again at the international financial institutions, at their mandates, and to actually agree a Bretton Woods II, um, you know, uh, agreement and put a system in place where funding can be generated to actually uh, be distributed equitably in the different regions and different countries of the world to support the implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement and of the SDGs, two fundamentally important framework, policy frameworks that have been agreed by states around the world, but that don't have the resources to enable proper implementation as yet. Well, thank you so much for making us uh, understand uh, you know, that bit of the puzzle. And every uh, financial entrepreneur who is listening in, or any entrepreneur in making who is listening in, please understand that this is a big problem in front of you to solve. If you can solve the uh, funding puzzle for the developing needs and uh, you know, specific to the goals, how can we generate funding in a more innovative and scalable way and use it to achieve these goals by 2030? And that's a big problem right there. You have it. Please think about it. Uh, yeah, so I was saying that uh, I have visited Europe on multiple occasions and I must admit that, uh, you know, Schengen Agreement and the Euro, all of these are indeed blessings because, uh, you know, I got, got to tra travel so many countries without worrying about getting visa from so many countries. And uh, the European Union, of course, has served as a model for many. And I say that European Union in many ways is uh, similar to India. So many you know, different parts and different pieces, but you somehow put it together and then you become stronger. And that's what European Union has shown. But in recent times with the North and South divide over the Greek and Italian economic crisis, and then uh, recently NATO's promise of mutual defense threatened by Trump, uh, what are the chances that you think EU or European Union will remain a strong institution? Okay, well, I suppose what I would say firstly is the EU has survived many crises. It has been through a particularly difficult period over the last, I would say, you know, decade or more. There's been the banking, you know, the international financial crisis. Then there was the refugee crisis in 2015. There's the Brexit crisis where the UK is leaving the EU. So there have been many different crises. And now there's the global pandemic. Um, but the EU is a resilient political system to date. It is over, it's more than 50 years old. 
It has survived many and its member states are very accustomed to working together. They know the benefits of economic integration, political integration and so on. And as you say, citizens enjoy the benefits of moving freely and working freely and anywhere in the region, you know, the, that they uh, choose. So and there really are like European citizenship is an increasingly meaningful concept, particularly for those of us who travel a lot internationally. So, you know, it, it is a resilient system. That's not to be complacent, though, and to say that it's going to survive uh, regardless of what happens next. I think a lot will depend on what the uh, leadership of the European Union decides to do next, um, because one of the things the European Union always promised to its member states and delivered on was greater prosperity. And I think if the European Union is not seen to be able to help its member states to get through this period of huge economic uncertainty and so on, I think citizens will lose confidence in it. And there's already a strong political movement towards um, nationalism, uh, a lot of populism, you know, let's just rely on ourselves, let's reclaim our sovereignty and so on. So there are undercurrents there that could be threatening to the European Union in the long run. I believe there's an opportunity at the moment for the European Union to take a position of global leadership because actually the European Union is the region of the world where the level of policy making and expertise around sustainable development is greatest. The Europe are the um, United States of America may be a leader in many areas. It's not a leader in sustainable development. You know, they have no time. They, most Americans are very dismissive of, of the idea of sustainable development and maybe living more likely on the planet. I think Europe has has long been aware of the crisis of, of uh, climate change and also the necessity to become more sustainable in the way we live and work. And, you know, the European Union could step into, you know, a, a position of global leadership in terms of, first of all, giving example to the rest of the world and showing how, uh, you know, a, a region like the EU could operate in a much more sustainable way and particularly reduce its reliance on fossil fuels because fossil fuels are what power most of the growing economies around the world and that how how you know modern european economies can be sustained by you know alternative um, renewable energies and also how citizens you know the, the, there's a lot of focus on um uh you know uh, using materials more you know there's a focus on reducing the kind of mass consumption that we're engaged with now and uh, you know looking at the life cycle of products and being a lot more um, careful about the way we consume the earth's resources. So I believe the European Union could show the rest of the world how to embrace sustainable development in a really meaningful way but that promises and guarantees quality of life to all of its citizens and that it brings its citizens with it also because there's a huge interest amongst European citizens in living better, in living in a way that's not going to pollute and destroy our natural world because we rely on the natural world, even our economies rely on a functioning ecosystem to be able to survive. So that I think is the dilemma for the EU at the moment wait, you know, let be overwhelmed by crises and go under even though it's been a, an incredibly successful uh, political system for over 50 years, or seize the opportunity, you know, adopt a position of global leadership, bring countries around the world with you. And I do think that China is also making promising noises around sustainable development. Of course, they're not, you know, they have a huge coal industry they have to, to decide what they're going to do about. And there's many other ways in which China also has to change its 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 behavior. But I suppose for me, the question is what the EU is going to do next. Will it allow the various forces that are trying, you know, that may possibly undermine it to do so? Um, or will it seize the moment and the opportunity to demonstrate global leadership and to partner with other, you know, powers around the world, global powers who are like China and India and others who may be interested in a new model of economic development, one that's much more sustainable and that will also offer, you know, a quali quality of life to its, its citizens, looking at the social and the uh, environmental dimension of uh, their activities as well as the economic. So that's the question. I can't answer it. Um, talk to me in another five or 10 years time and I think we'll be a lot clearer um, as to how the EU will fare. Right, and I think, uh... 
one good thing about any crisis is that humanity always comes together so let's hope that that positive force is used by eu to become an even stronger institution and probably implement all the goals uh, you know th that are there in the sdgs and on that note i will ask uh, another question you are a member of the sdg watch uh, europe and you have been at the forefront of implementing or monitoring the implementation of SDGs across different European countries. Can you give us some examples and tell us uh, in which of the goals you have progressed a lot and which of the goals uh, there is still a lot to do? Well, it's interesting that you ask that question because um, the EU has prioritized and its member states have prioritized certain um, areas, certain goal areas to focus on. And obviously the areas of climate action, of energy, um, are very important and obviously infrastructure and innovation and so on. But there are other areas that the EU member states should be looking at around poverty and hunger and uh, social inclusion and so on, where they don't believe, you know, there's a bit of denial going on about the extent to which poverty exists within Europe and how many refugees exist within Europe. There's a lot of, of um, issues that maybe European member states haven't been quite so willing to look at and to admit that they need to really tackle. So I would say that um, the EU has certainly made great strides on uh, climate action and um, it is showing global leadership on that. Its member states are all being strongly encouraged to look at you know, climate mitigation or at least um, mitigating their the emissions, their carbon emissions, and taking strong action to try to um, you know, develop new, more carbon neutral economies. Um, but there are many other areas they do need to, to, um, to look at. One of the things I would say that's very particular to the EU is that it has a huge impact, not just its policies have a huge impact, not just within its own territory, but externally. So the EU is a big international donor, but it's also um, you know, at the center of the international trading system. It brokers a lot of international investment agreements and so on. So it has to look at the impact of its external policies or of its policies externally as well as internally. And that's something else the EU hasn't been so good at doing up to now. So when it talks about the SDGs, it's looking internally at its member states and looking at certain areas, but it's not looking at, you know, to what extent is the EU contributing to perhaps poverty or hunger or inequalities overseas uh, through the way it, it, it you know, negotiates trade agreements or whatever. So all of these areas do need to be looked at. If I had to score the European Union and its member states at the moment, I'd say, you know, they're doing an okay job, but there's a lot more that could be done. We need a lot more ambition from the EU and the EU itself as a system, a regional wide system could develop ways in which could work together much more effectively so that you would actually get the benefit of collective action as opposed to each member state doing their own thing. That hasn't happened yet and it does need to happen. So I think the EU, you know, if you were signing its report card, we'd say good, but a lot more to do. Well, there is always a lot more to do for all of us and that's why people should come together and take action. And... Uh, and now we have, of course, spoken about Europe and justice and almost all the sub-sections of the Goal 16. Now, let me put forward one question that, uh, you know, the, in a world that is full of conflict and conflict is literally all around us. Like right now we are having a conflict with China and, you know, uh, the Syrian conflict that is going on. The conflict just never ends, right? All around so in a world that is so full of conflict, how do we develop a culture of peace and provide justice to all and also build stronger institutions? It's very difficult, but please throw us some suggestions and lights that you have, some blueprint that can probably help us do it. Well, I'm not sure there's a blueprint for, for uh, developing peaceful societies, but I do know, and I think a lot of research would um, support the idea that where you have inequalities in societies, you know, where you have poverty, where you have insecurity, where you have, um, you know, groups of people vying for the same limited resources. There's going to be conflict and there's going to be instability. Where you have corruption, where you have, you know, governments that are ignoring the needs and the interests of their peoples, there will be conflict. So, you know, I think an awful lot will depend on creating 
healthy and and uh, societies that that provide protection for ordinary people you know and that try to create kind of equal societies so that you know that's why i think the sdgs are so powerful they don't just look i mean the, if the if sdg 16 were the only sdg would it create peace or could we create peace? I'm not sure. But because we look at education, because the SDGs look at tackling hunger, poverty, inequality, you know, addressing many issues around economic development, around climate change and so on, I think they address many of the issues that are drivers of conflict and instability. And I also think that the way in which the SDGs uh, are supposed to work is that if there's a whole of society approach and different sections of society are involved and incentivized to work together to achieve the SDGs, it helps people to put their differences aside. So we need a big unifying narrative, I think, that's going to help people who are, you know, at war with each other or basically who only see their differences at the moment to come together. I mean, the threat of climate change is one threat that is going to mean that you know, if we don't forget about some of our differences and realize the common interest we have in trying to save the planet and save ourselves, you know, really, we, we you know, we're not going to be around for much longer um, to, to, to um, engage in conflict or anything else. So I think the, the, there is a possibility that the SDGs, if they were properly promoted by governments and if the public awareness was raised of the SDGs, that we could try to find a way to bring the global community together. And I think we are going to enter into a new era of what we call global governance. And I think we will see the UN taking a much stronger role, looking internationally in terms of how development happens. I mean, I know the EU ha or the UN has had that kind of role, but in a in a much more, um, you know, much stronger and more systematic way. And I think the people of the world have to come together. And I find as a member of an NGO, a civil society organization, we are a global network, but I am amazed and delighted to see how NGOs everywhere are connecting up. They're just the huge amount of interconnections happening from the local to the, you know, what they call the subnational to the national level, to the regional, to the global level. And there's connections being formed and partnerships being formed and people seeing common interests, you know, people in places like India seeing common interests with people in the Pacific and in, you know, uh, America and in Europe. And, and so we're thinking more as a global community and there's a huge rise in global consciousness. So that kind of, you know, strong, um, focus on global cooperation has the potential to try to distract us from the small, petty, local and, you know, even national conflicts that we invest so much time and energy in, and to really focus on the urgency of addressing some of these global challenges with support and resourcing from the international community so that we can actually protect ourselves and our children's future. And I think if we can do that, there's some hope that we will actually, you know, prom promote and and encourage cooperation rather than conflict. And you know, we do have the tools in Goal 16 to systematically try to monitor and you know take the steps necessary and work towards the targets that have been deemed necessary to create more secure and more stable and more peaceful societies. But I think it will be done in in a wider context of you know global cooperation on the SDGs. If we do it, if we manage to, you know, sort of think intelligently as a species and save ourselves from what will otherwise be a very unpleasant and, you know, uncomfortable future. So my hope is I'm going to be optimistic and say, we'll do it. We'll come together globally. And I think even discussions like this where I'm in Ireland and I don't know what parts of the world you're in, but we are having a conversation about the same issues and the same concerns that that kind of global cooperation and global consciousness will help to lift us out of, as we say, our everyday, you know, uh, disagreements and tensions and conflicts and help us to focus on the bigger picture and to work together towards a safer, healthier future for us all. That's so well put. And essentially what you're trying to say is that the world needs a North Star, which can drive every one of us together toward that single goal uh, you know, equitably and, uh, you know, together. 
so that uh, you know we all can take the actions that is needed and this is just a small step from us uh, uh, here at youth forum to try and exactly do that now on that note i have a young student from india who is joining from maharashtra uh, radhika uh, so she has a couple of questions that she would like to put forward so radhika please introduce yourself and ask your questions uh thank you sir uh, hi my name is radhika and i'm a student of international studies at asmbis uh, school uh, my core interests are inclusive of human rights and in particular refugee rights so uh, my first question to you is that in 2018 19 there was this uh, global compact on refugees which uh, came out and its uh, major aim is to uh, develop a political will uh, across the globe across different stakeholders to support the pressurized uh, supporting nations and uh, the refugees for a better future ahead and a better life ahead having said that uh, you spoke of a uh, you spoke of the uh, human rights concept wise so uh, most of these uh, refugees uh, 50% of them they come from the uh, underdeveloped countries and they settle in underdeveloped or developing countries now when countries and uh, stakeholders come together to help these nations what would be the aspect of human rights which would be followed which would be a, a western human rights perspective or a developing human rights perspective because those two are different uh, in context Yes, yes. Um, I think I understand your question, and um, you know, it gets to the heart of that question of what are the human rights of you know refugees of people who have been obliged to leave their countries of origin for whatever reason and try to create a better life for themselves uh, elsewhere. And I think you know. Um, I think attitudes in the West are certainly changing. I think people are becoming much more aware of the plight of refugees. I think um, you know there's a lot more awareness of um, you know the rights of people to leave situations that are intolerable and to move elsewhere. But there's also resistance. Obviously, there's also fear of being overwhelmed. There's a lot of you know. Um, a lot of media and others who who create fear and who create um, resistance on the part of host communities. So you're right. There's a big um, challenge to try to to resolve those different views. And 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 you know, I don't think they're going to be resolved overnight. But I do think that uh, the more discussion we have about them, I mean, I think the global compact is something that should not just be discussed and agreed at very remote global levels, but it should be something that permeates into the discussion that happens about refugees in every country so that people can, because attitudes will change, you know, and I think, you know, people sometimes have to come around to understanding, especially complex issues. They need opportunities to think it through, to discuss it publicly, to hear, you know, others discussing it, they need to hear. And it's been very helpful in Ireland where I live. We've had a lot of focus in the media on uh, hearing the voices, the direct voices of refugees, on hearing people's stories. And once you do that, you realize, you know, all the fear breaks down, the idea that these are something, these people are different from me. And you actually start recognizing the humanity of the refugees and the fact that any of us could end up in that same position. So I think it will take time, but I think, you know, the global compact uh, is a good thing. And I think we do need to think globally about refugees and we need to think about uh, arrangements that are fair and um, that, you know, respect the rights of all. It's not easy to do. And as you say, there'll sometimes be a perception of competing rights and competing um, interests. But I do think um, it's something that, you know, as a global community, we need to, to focus on more. And I think we can come to um, an acceptable you know, a global agreement, but one that has to have buy-in from people at all levels. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, I have uh, one more question, uh, which is, uh, wh what, as a person who has been advocating SDGs for so long now, what are uh, your uh, key suggestions, three key suggestions for you like me or my age, uh, how could we contribute in promoting and uh, in our personal spaces implementing these SDGs in general 
and the goal 16 in particular? Gosh, I'm being asked a lot of hard questions uh, this evening. So I suppose what I would say is the three things that young people can do in terms of promoting the SDGs in general and the uh, Goal 16 in particular would be firstly, you have to get your government, you have to put your government under pressure. You have to keep, so youth have an advantage. They're full of energy. They, um, you know, can make a lot of noise. They can be very active on social media. They can engage in a lot of campaigning and so on and uh, really make their voices heard. So I think keep the pressure up on your government. Say to the, your government, the SDGs are the future. We want to see you implementing the SDGs. What are you doing on goal one? What are you doing on goal two? What are you doing on goal 16? And keep the pressure up. So that's one thing I think you, you could do. I think as well as uh, keeping pressure on your governments, I think that, um, you know, youth need to also partner with other uh, groups. So, uh, you know, you, when we talk about youth, the young populations in most countries and particularly in a lot of developing countries are very large sections of the population. But even still, even if you make up 50 percent of the population on your own, youth won't achieve the SDGs or the full implementation of the SDGs. So you have to start partnering with other groups, with women's groups, with, um, you know, uh, with private sector companies, with um, academics and uh, researchers, with trade unions. So you need to form partnerships and build your strength, build coalitions that can work together, that can campaign together and so on. And again, keep pressure on your government. And I suppose the third thing you can do is there is something that your government contributes to um, every couple of years. It has to submit what's called a VNR, a Voluntary National Review, a report on progress with the SDGs um, to the UN. So what youth can do is to develop its own report. And this is something that I would have encouraged and the organisations I've worked with have encouraged that you produce you know, civil society and youth as part of civil society can produce its own shadow report. So your government will go to the UN with its own report saying, we're doing very well on the SDGs. We're implementing goal, you know, one, two, three, right up to 16 and 17. But as a young person, you might not agree with your government. You might say, hold on a minute, the government is saying it's doing this, but actually this is what we experience in our societies. So it is very important that young people keep monitor, you know, how the different SDG goals are being implemented and produce their own accounts, their own reports and present those also at the um, the UN uh, high level political forum, which happens um, every year in July. But your government will only report every couple of years. But you can still make a lot of noise, do a lot of research, you know, and and provide your own uh, experiences um, in a very well-researched report that will have an impact on other countries and your government has to present its report you know to an international audience and if the youth from the country are saying sorry we're not in agreement with our government we don't see things we think the government is exaggerating this or is not being quite truthful on that it can have quite a powerful effect your government doesn't want to be embarrassed in an international forum so I think that's a, the third thing I would say that youth can do is to really um, monitor the implementation of the SDGs, draw up your own reports with your own accounts and, and share those in international forums where your government will be reporting. And I think that will keep your government on its toes. On goal 16, I would say, you know, work with human rights um, organisations because What's at the heart of Goal 16 are human rights. And I think what Goal 16 says to us is that sustainable development isn't possible unless the human rights agenda is properly uh, promoted and implemented. And so I would say work with all the institutions. If you have a national human rights institution in your country, but if you have you know, non-governmental organizations who are working on human rights and any other actors at all, a lot of academics might be involved in human, the human rights agenda in some way or another, work with them and build up a strong human rights community in your country so that you can keep focusing on goal 16 and make sure that you do achieve um, a peaceful and inclusive society. Thank you so much, uh, Deirdre, and thank you so much, Radhika, for the questions. And, uh, you know, you so rightfully hit the nail of the coffin because uh, the aim of this platform for us was to exactly create that report, 
do that research, talk to all of you, try and understand each goal in depth, and then activate you to do that research and then come up with that report so that we can actually hold the account, uh, hold the government accountable uh, for, because right now, uh, while the pandemic is on, everything is an excuse. So they're saying, no, no, that's not the priority because there's so many other things that we need to solve. But it's no more a question of priority. It is the essential basic that we need for you know the world to be there for us. Mm -hmm. And one of our other speakers also said that it's equally important to create better children uh, you know, or, or, and leave a better planet for the children. So these two essentially have to come together and, and so rightfully put. So uh, I, if I have to sum up, uh, it's essentially three or four main points that you mentioned. So innovative funding, global cooperation, and the common mission and North Star for the whole world is probably going to help us get there. Uh, and we are to almost uh, towards the end of uh, our conversation. And before I conclude, I have one question for you. Uh, if you have to sum up your vision for a better world in one sentence, what would that be? Well, I happen to believe that um, the most important thing for the achievement of the SDGs, and I think the SDGs will definitely create a better world, but the most important thing is the involvement of the whole of society in, you know, monitoring and and promoting the SDGs. So for me, it's a whole of society approach. If we can involve everybody and make everybody, every section of society take ownership of the SDGs, then we will realize uh, the vision of the SDGs. So I would say whole of society involvement in SDG governance would be my, my takeaway sentence. Thank you uh, for that uh, line and thank you for that comment. And uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and talk to us. I mean, it really means a lot to us now to conclude. Uh, and for a world where no one is left behind, it has never been clearer that all of us have a role to play in order to bring about change. Whoever you are, no matter where you come from, every one of us can make a difference. Every action truly counts. Get involved. Attend the SDG Action Conclave 2020, participate in the SDG quiz, help raise awareness about the goals, and connect with a global community of passionate volunteers. This Global Goals Week, let us come together to spread the knowledge about people, planet, and our sustainable development goals. Thank you all for joining us. Follow us on Instagram at Youth Forum India for all the updates. And don't forget to join us for the next session.